You are now tuned into Shotgun Sports USA. Powered by Winchester. Recorded in the U.S. And streaming all over the world. We talk to shotgun shooters from all disciplines, championship winning coaches, gun clubs, world class target setters, vendors, and industry leading companies that fuel the sport. If you are into clay target sports, you are at the right place for insider information from some of the best in the world every single week. Remember to subscribe to our podcast, leave us a review, and connect with us on social media. You can also catch our episodes on ShotgunSportsUSA.com. Being a brand name in the clay target industry, Rick Hemingway has said, Have you ever noticed almost all major sporting events are being run by pro-matic traps? Think about that statement for a minute. He's right, and you may want to consider that before making your next purchase. Rick is the largest Promatic dealer specializing in individual and commercial trap sales. Rick provides skeet, trap, five stand, and sporting clays, designs, installs, and service. He also offers accessories such as solar panels, wireless release systems, as well as the hottest item on the market, the Claybot by Renair Products. Visit www.backwoodsquailclub.com or give him a call at 843-546-546. 1466. My guest today is a professional shooter, a coach, and now owns the brand new Cypress Creek Shooting Lodge in Greenbrier, Arkansas. Please welcome to the show, David Radulovich. What's up, David? What's going on, Justin? <laughs> you and I were just talking a second ago. Um, you made this big post on Facebook about you're going to be out of town for a little while going hunting. Where are you hunting? Yeah. Uh, going up to Montana to do uh, some public land hunting on some for, for some uh, grouse and partridge. And I got to say something about that. <laughs> Talk about a massive typo problem. I put on there that I wasn't going to be back until November 19th. Yeah. And... <laughs> <laughs> I had, I was, I had, I probably got a hundred phone calls in five minutes of people like, what are you talking about? I, yeah, yeah. I have a deposit down on lessons to come down to Cypress Creek. Like in October, you're going for two months. That was <laughs> Who, bad. What, now, what are you going to hunt birds? Yeah. So you're going to take off a couple of weeks to go track down some birds. Yeah. About 10 days. It's <laughs> fun. I mean, the, uh, uh, you know, I mean, if you do what we do, especially as a job, um, and I, I might make some people mad at me for saying this, but I don't think it's very fun to go to like, uh, to go hunt like pen raised birds. Um, because most of the time I find myself letting them get away before I tr try to make a shot because honestly, it's kind of not fair. Right. You know? You're right about <laughs> and that. And the, yeah. And, um, so this is, it sounds crazy, but I like doing, you know, like normally I, last year I went up to Wisconsin, the year before that, Michigan. I mean, you'll walk a hundred miles in, in the time that you're there. And, uh, I mean, if you take home one to three birds a day, that's, I mean, that's a good day. I mean, because it's, uh, for the people listening, if you're going like grouse hunting on public land, it is basically like the coolest thing that you can do it is so hard but when you actually do get one man is it cool i mean you are cutting through nasty brush and thick young cuts of trees and working with the dogs i mean you can have like you know that my, my dad can be standing 10 15 feet away from me and i can't even see him so you got to use gps to get around uh a dog could go on point 100 yards away and it'll take you an hour and a half to get to him yeah i'm out on that it's I mean, yeah. it's cool though. I'm telling you, you know, we've, I've hunt, I've quail hunted down here. Of course, it's just pen raised birds. You gotta walk up and kick them in the head before they fly off. Yeah. But yeah. you know, I would just think that all day long and I shot three birds, I would have to find something else to do. 
Well, it's not like you're going all day and, and you don't get any action. I mean, you're, you're going to take home maybe three birds, but you know, I mean, you're, it takes you five flushes on one bird to actually be able to get a shot off. Cause you know, you'll, a, a grouse will flush and you know, it'll fly in a direction you try to turn to go to get it and you'll hit a tree with the gun and you can't shoot it. So then you got to hunt it up again and then hunt it up again, finally get a good shot. So there's a lot of work and effort that goes into, into each bird. And it's just fun. Yeah. Well, I might need to try it one time. Only place I have those up north, though, right? Well, there's different types of grouse. Um, and, yeah, the ones that we're hunting are up north. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we haven't done anything. We haven't recorded anything together in a while. It's been a long time. It has been. And I think it's just because I follow you on Facebook. And <laughs> you, you lay out your whole life on Facebook, like this this shoot, for instance. So yeah. I don't feel like I need to talk to you. but. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just trying to help you do your job. <laughs> yeah. Is that what it is? Yeah. Y- you know, there's some big news, uh, that surrounds you. And I think you know what this is, but I, you date Kaylee Browning, which mm-hmm. I think is kind of funny, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, she dates you. That's just, that, that's the funny part. And then, well, you know, I, the, the argument that I get all the time is that, you know, she must be blind. But she's an Olympic medalist in shooting, so obviously she could see. Yeah, well, that's what I'm going to say. She she just won the silver medal in trap in, at Tokyo. Yeah. So yeah. you know, congratulations to her. But yeah. But does that make your accomplishments feel small, almost like non-existent? <laughs> <laughs> you know what was funny is, you know, like when she was going, getting ready to go to the Olympics. I knew she was going to win a, a medal. I didn't know which one, but I knew it was going to happen. Right. And um it was such a cool experience because you know you i've known her since i was 10 years old or however old i was and so you get to understand the personality of the person how they compete how they deal with stress get to watch her in in high pressure moments while she's trying to do that and i just knew that for her if she could get into the final it was going to be good news and i'm never i mean i have a lot of friends that have won olympic medals but i've never been in but as i've never been a a part of somebody's life that has won one right right? so i've never got to experience really from secondhand view what it's like to win one and so in my head i'm like well i won a world v-test championship it's probably gonna be about the same thing right and so uh when she did win that and got home not kidding you justin we go to the airport to to pick her up and the news was reporting on what time she was landing. There were hundreds of people in tiny little, uh, little rock airport. I didn't even really get to talk to her until we got to the house. Uh, news channels are showing up to the business, calling her, texting her, um, calling me, uh, asking to do interviews like, uh, uh, like uh, for me to talk about, you know, what it's like to be, you know, witness all this and everything i'm like man this is definitely not at all like winning a world feet test because <laughs> i got home and nobody cared <laughs> yeah you just know? just a thousand people that shoot that's it right yeah, yeah. <laughs> not even yeah so you know she and she probably don't talk about this but i was thinking i guarantee you that the that the calls the opportunities that she's gotten since she's been back has been unbelievable oh you, yeah you know it, just yeah there's, there's no telling, you know, at the, the messages and the calls and all that stuff. It's gotta be crazy and just overwhelming. I'm sure it's, it, yeah, it can be overwhelming and it can be, it can be stressful. Um, but it's also really cool. You know, I mean the, uh, you work, you set your life up for two decades chasing one thing and you finally accomplish it. And, uh, you gotta live in the moment and enjoy that. Um, and uh, you know, what everybody sees is, you know, you walk up on the podium and you accept the medal and, uh, and and everybody sees what happens after and nobody sees what goes into doing it. And what was really cool for me was, you know, it, we started dating, um, like a little over two years ago. So if that was a normal relationship, I'd only really have this understanding of what her life was like two years before she won this, but she, she's my best friend. And, um, 
I saw what it was like before she even chose to follow that. And so I've seen and known all of the dedication and the sacrifice and what you give up. And, and, um, and so, you know, it, it, I told her, I was like, you know what, you know, you need to just enjoy this and have fun with these interviews and, and take up the opportunities. And there, I mean, there's a lot, I, I can't talk about some, uh, because not some of them aren't set in stone and some of them are still being negotiated and stuff, but it, it's amazing. I mean, talk about mind blowing for me to see the impact that she had or has on her community, on what, what how cool that, um, shooting sports, how much press shooting sports can actually get, um, which is something I never understood. Uh, it, it's been a really cool, from an outsider perspective, for me to watch and observe this. It's been pretty amazing. Yeah. And you know, when you won World Fee Task and you came back, your, your, I don't think your checkbook was any any fatter than when you <laughs> left. But when she no. when, when she comes back, it's a, different, it's a different story. You actually get paid yeah. to win a medal, which is cool. We don't have to get into do. to the breakdown of it, but you get paid to win medals. You do, yeah. It's not as much as you'd think. Um is, which is crazy. Actually, the, the one of the com- one of the countries that pays the least amount to win a medal is the United States, right. um, I, which is un- unfortunate. But uh, you know, what, w- there's a really amazing documentary that I'm just going to mention. Everybody should listen to or watch. Um, and there's some. Uh, uh, I mean, the 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 part, the main focus of it is on the mental health of Olympic athletes, which is something that everybody should be talking about. It's really important. But if you watch that, you realize there's guys on there like uh, Michael Phelps and Apollo Anton Ono and Sean White and, um, I mean, major names. Mm-hmm. And and people think, oh, you know, those guys are probably making millions of dollars from, you know, from winning all those medals. They're getting like $600 a month, you know, like <laughs> it's not really anything. It's just the endorsements um, they get. It's the endorsements. Yeah. And yeah. so that depends on the popularity of the sport. Um, you know, and in that documentary is called the, uh, the weighted gold. It's a really good, uh, Michael Phelps is the one that, that did it, but it's a good, a good, uh, good documentary. But yeah, it's, it's crazy. I got a, well, I'll let you continue with your questions. <laughs> I got too many stories. <laughs> well, tell them. I mean, we got plenty of time. Go ahead. I had, uh, uh, one, one year, like to kind of, um, piggyback off your question about what, you know, it's like, how does it make you feel compared to what you won? The, uh, the, the day before I left to go to that regional in Wisconsin, um, uh, Kaylee and I decided to go out to dinner and we went to, uh, <laughs> we went to the sushi restaurant in downtown Little Rock. Yeah. Um, and so we're, because if we went like in Conway or in the town that, that we live in where our business is, we could kind of like know everybody there. So we wanted to have like some time alone. So we go into Little Rock and we're sitting there and the waiter comes out and he wants a picture. So I take a picture and then they bring out an appetizer that has the Olympic rings. We didn't, I mean, we didn't say anything. They just knew. And uh, I mean, we drove an hour away from town uh, and bring a, a thing out that has the Olympic rings. And then, so people start paying attention. People start get like coming over, asking questions, talking to her and wanting pictures like little kids are coming up. And this one guy, <laughs> This one guy looks at me, he goes, man, how does it feel to be dating a girl that can shoot guns so good? Like, it must be kind of emasculating. (laughs) (laughs) I I was like, yeah, it's pretty embarrassing. (laughs) Yeah. Wait, did you tell him, hey, I won World Feet Task one time? (laughs) No, I didn't say anything. (laughs) He just said, "What, what is that? (laughs) Yeah, exactly. (laughs) (laughs) Did you tell him your medal was painted gold? Yeah, I didn't even get a medal. I got a piece of glass <laughs> and a big fat check that said zero. Yeah, yeah, and had to come home. At least you didn't have. Yeah. To, at least you didn't have quarantine like Haley did. That's true. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so all right. So talk about World Fee Task and the Olympics. Where would you rank the two as far as let's just the hardest? Okay, which one is the hardest in your opinion to achieve? Well, that I mean. The hardest to achieve, I, I mean, I don't think there's anything in sports that's that's more prestigious than winning an Olympic medal. And that's for a reason. I mean, 
you can spin it any way you want, you know, like mm-hmm. at, at the world fee task, uh, you know, you got to compete against over a thousand people at the Olympics. You're competing against, you know, 30, 40, 50, however many, but the reality of it is the world fee task. I'm competing against 30, 40, 50 people. The other people are just there shooting. Um, That's true. the, uh, at the world, you know, the world fee task is the pinnacle of my game, but I get a chance at it every year and I can just enter it. Uh, yeah. For the Olympics, you only get a chance at it once every four years and you can't just enter it. You have to qualify and then you have to earn the right and then you have to go over there. And, and so, I mean, it's um, it, even if the Olympics were anybody could show up and shoot them, you know, you're, you, you get you get 25 percent of the opportunities to win it. So I, I would I think if you talk about objectively, mm-hmm. there's no way to argue that olympics are not harder to win or more prestigious than winning an olympic game but i think there's another there's another side of that which is um subjectively like we were talking about this in a in a group text with with some people uh with with derek and uh you know congratulating him for making the olympics and um one of the things that I brought up, which, which is, you know, like I choose to do sporting and feet task because that's the game I love. And 12 years ago, I tried to see if I could make an Olympic team. Uh, Cause I thought, you know, man, it would be so cool to win an Olympic medal. And so I went and I went to Colorado. I lived there for like two months. I shot those games. I shot nationals. I did, I did all that stuff. And, um, I realized that there was no way that I will ever win a medal in that because I don't love it as much as I love my game. Not saying that I, that I'm not good at it or that for me it's harder. I just don't love it. And there's people that I'd have to beat in there that love that game as much as I love my game. And so one of the things you have to realize is you, by saying that the Olympics are, are much more prestigious and much harder to win you can't take away from guys that make Team USA for the World Fee Task or and I'm not even talking about myself because in a way it's my job to, to make that team and it's my job to go win a World Fee Task. But when you talk about like the veterans and the, and the juniors and the ladies and the super veterans, for them, that's their Olympics because they don't play a game that's in the Olympics. And that is representing your country and shooting for a title for your country and trying to get them to raise your flag above everybody else's and listen to your national anthem. And so um, I think if you think of it that way, um, they're on an equivalent stage of, of, of prestigiousness or prestigiousness, however you want to call it. But I mean, I would argue objectively, there's no question. Yeah. Yeah. I think the only person to do both of those was Richard Falls. Uh, am I right? Yeah, for World Fita. No, you. I, I believe you're right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he's done both, which is pretty impressive, also. And so, he's an amazing shooter. I mean, yeah. gosh. Oh yeah, he is. And his son. I mean, if you keep up with him on, you know, Instagram, Facebook, or whatever. Yeah. I mean, his son's going to be a good shooter too. Oh, he's super good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Castellani shooting vests are manufactured in Italy and internationally recognized by elite shooters as the most popular lightweight shooting vests on the market. Castellani vests are especially known for their Italian styling and superior craftsmanship and quality, making them a vest of choice for all shooting disciplines. Ultimate Shooting Accessories is the exclusive supplier of Castellani vests in the United States. Visit ultimateshootingaccessories.com for more information and to place your order. So you, you brought up the, the regional a few minutes ago, and I shot with you at the mm-hmm. regional, and I don't remember the last time that I had that much fun at a shoot. You, you it know, was fun, wasn't it? Yeah, I mean, you shot. It was really like a show you kind of put on. We all stood back and just watched. But, <laughs> I mean, you showed up with a your, – your guns broke, which I assume you like it that way. Uh, <laughs> I got to get a sponsorship from Gorilla Tape. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I can have Kaylee's agent work that one out for me. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you have no intention to fix it. It don't sound like. I mean, it's just no. I don't want to fix it. I like it. Yeah, yeah. We'll go into that in a second. All right. So you show yeah. you, you show up with a broken gun, 
and you mm-hmm. pull up in an electric car where the whole ass end has been knocked off of it. All right. <laughs> he's got, he's got yep. this Tesla that the whole it's like, it looks like he backed into a brick wall. And, and then and then he had on shoes that were made for people with like you know feet problems, like corrective shoes. Yeah. Or I don't even know what they are. They're <laughs> no. like, I don't know what they, they were. Are. They're they're called Viva Barefoot. They're awesome for shooting. They're they're super flat, uh, and you get like the way I shoot. It actually helps me. You can feel the ground. You have good balance and rotation and everything. What if there's a rock down there? Well, you better not to be standing on it. <laughs> <laughs> you you like those because you can roll them up and stick them in your pocket. <laughs> you yeah, make, and then you can walk around barefoot, right? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So with all this stuff going on, how did you end up shooting like you did? Was it because it was me and Tom and Steve and all no, of us? If, it wasn't, if, if you guys weren't there, I would have won the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Uh, the, uh, um, yeah, I mean, the, the whole thing with the car, that was an incident on the way there. I mean, a guy got road rage and was running me off, off the road <laughs> of the highway on 35 North. Uh, I mean, he literally going 80 miles an hour, hit me twice, ran me off the road. I had to call the cops. Um, and that was the whole process, but the, uh, uh, so this is, here's the thing with that. I've, I have not been able to practice no more than two times since, uh, since November. And I've shot the world feed task in the U S open and the Arkansas state. Uh, so three shoots since November, and my schedule has just been crazy opening up Cypress Creek and you know, the, I mean, it's been amazing. I'm so thankful for all my students that are flying out there to take lessons, and new people that are coming and, and uh, you know, having to build a course, start a club, manage all that. And, you know, we're not, finally we are now, but at that time we weren't big enough to hire people to help us. And so it, it was, uh, is he- crazy hectic. I didn't have any time to work on my game, but what was happening was I've been teaching so much that um i honestly going into it number one my 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 schedule changed last minute and i signed up like two days before i got there i didn't think i was going to be able to make it i didn't prep for it nothing and i said you know what i'm just gonna go have fun shoot with my buddies and just enjoy it who really cares but i did have a goal and um because i haven't been able to practice and i've been teaching so much my mechanics like what i teach mechanically is so salient and conscious in the forefront of my mind i'm uh, like i feel like even though i haven't been able to practice and that is not an excuse uh that i have never in my life had better mechanics than i have right now and um and it's just because of the things i've been trying to to, to kind of like reposition or or rebuild in, in what i teach and looking for answers in places i didn't know that i even had questions uh and then working really hard on all the parts of my game. And so I went to the shoot and I was like, you know, I have not given myself a chance to prep for any match this year. I haven't done any practice and I'm really kind of sick and tired of showing up to a shoot and running out of gas halfway through or making a mistake mentally, not talking about mechanics, but, you know, strategy choice or not prepping during the shoot or not being prepared or ready and bringing something or not putting effort into, you know, my research or planning phase in the round or kind of giving up halfway through because I don't feel like fighting the whole round. Um, And I I was like, the only thing I want to do at this shoot is just prove to myself that I can compete my mechanics are as good as I can get right now. I've never had them better and I have full confidence in that, but I didn't have confidence that I could compete because I hadn't put together a good round since before, since the nationals. Cause my round in, uh, in November at the world feed task, I just kind of showed up and goofed off. And so I just noticed a big decline in, in uh, as stupid as it sounds, I forgot what it was like to be in the headspace that I need to be to win a match. And, um, and so that was my goal. I was like, I don't care if I win or lose. I just want, I just want to do that. And chances are probably if I do that really good, I am going to win. Um, and I, I honestly, I could not have been, you know, I mean, I didn't win. I, I got one below Finizzi, uh, who won. So t- tied for runner up, lost a shoot off with Zach, ended up in third. Um, but I knew, I mean, after I finished my last shot on the course, I, I knew if I tied with anybody, it was already over. Cause I mean, I've spent every, 
for an analogy, congratulations to your brother on winning that, uh, on winning, what is it called? Nas- just U S nationals. Yeah. Yeah. That was it. Yeah. Yeah. So congratulations to him for winning that, but it'd be like if he was running his last run with, with on fumes, that yeah. was me, you know, in that right. shoot off. I just, I wasn't playing to win in the shoot off. I was playing to win out on the course and I did that. I did exactly what I wanted. I was so happy. It was so much fun. Yeah. Um, and, and so that's what it was. There's a crazy amount of trust in my mechanics, having no doubt in that being able to do things, um, you know, like for example, that last round that we shot, you know, the mindset that I'm in is, all right, we've got to shoot this course in the wind. And the first half of the course where the wind is blowing targets in, everything is edgy right off the ground. So they're not coming in. They're getting blown up and down, which is hard to make a move on. We get to the second half of the course where everything's getting blown out. Everything's big belly birds going out 15, 20 yards further than what they were set for. And I made the choice. I was like, look, I mean, and you shot, you know, with me. So you, you would have seen them. I mean, it was shooting stuff stupid fast. But my, my plan was like, I'm gonna, not going to give this wind a chance to beat me. If I lose, I want it to be my fault and not because I was playing safe and defensive and trying to make clean moves. I was trying to cut luck and chance out of the round. And I feel like I, I honest to God, I don't know if I've ever shot a, 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 a round where it was mistake free. And even if I didn't, even though I didn't win those two days, I feel like I don't, I didn't have one mistake. No, it was unbelievable. I'm telling you, it was, it was, it was, I don't know, you know, and I, I've shot with you before and it, yeah. you know, and, and now I shot with you, you know, here and it's, and you, I'm kind of going to talk about your, the way you set up. So mm-hmm. the first time I, you know, I saw you shoot, you, you point your gun up in the air and just f- explain all this for me. Cause I really don't know what it means. You point your gun up in the air, then you bring your mm-hmm. gun down. Then, and as, as the gun's coming down, your butt's poking out. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And then you drop it down. It seems like again, and then you move over to the, yes. to where you want to go. You're going to explain all that because I have no clue what that means. <laughs> it looked like, a, it looked st- like a dance. I don't, I don't know what it was. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to see me dance. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty bad the uh is, is it about the, like the setup when you go to shoot oh if you think that was bad i'm telling you dancing is 10 times worse <laughs> <laughs> it's a good thing i make hundreds of dollars shooting sporting clays because i'm not gonna be a dancer <laughs> yeah. the yeah but no i've got i've got a, a student and um from from new york and he's he's labeled it ass out shooting yeah and uh so I'll do my best to explain this to you without being able to show you anything. But um, the way that I approach shooting and the way that I approach teaching, I never want to be asked, why do you do this? And, and have to give the answer of, because that's how I do it. I don't like that answer. It's unacceptable to me. Mm-hmm. And I, if someone asks me why, I want to be able to present them not with something that is non-tangible or something that's made up that, you know, well, because that's what it's always been, or that's how I was taught, or that's what the mechanics are that the NSCA certified. No, I don't like that at all. I want to be able to say, because math, science, uh, physiology, body mechanics, those are, those are what I give the roots of my movement to, and that's what I base how I shoot out of. So the first thing that you see me doing is on every shot being completely, I start completely vertical, totally straight, neutral balance, neutral balance, both on my left and right foot and neutral balance in the back and the front of my feet. And then you'll see me point the gun up in the air and put it in my shoulder. And what I'm doing is I'm mounting the gun up at 45 degrees in the air with a vertical posture. When I mount the gun at 45 degrees in the air, it's the only position that you can mount the gun and not have to modify any part of your body, meaning like I don't have to bring my head down or bring my shoulder up or bring my head over. It's the only uh, gun angle to body angle that you can mount your gun and not have to modify your body and have it both touch your shoulder and your face at the same time. Why is that important? Because in the way that I shoot, I want to eliminate all of the tension that I can because tension promotes the lack of movement and the ma- lack of mobility and the lack of control. So I don't want tension in my shoulder or my neck. 
Um, I don't want to have to have an awkward head position. I want everything to be fluidly dynamic and, and, and be able to move. So I go vertical posture, 45 degrees up in the air with the gun. Then you'll see me coming down. And when I'm coming down, that's when you're seeing my, my butt come out. Basically, what's happening is <laughs> what I'm trying to do is um, it, there's two ways to bend over. And, and I've uh, <laughs> that sounded really bad. <laughs> At least, you know, more than one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, man. So <laughs> I'm going to have to start all over. I can't remember what I was going to say. <laughs> I hope Tom and Leslie no, so will get excited. <laughs> <laughs> holy mackerel <laughs> okay so the uh, i've heard a lot of guys um on the podcast talking about uh, two two in particular talking about that if they watch me shoot now or if you watch me shoot a few years ago it's completely different and now i'm leaning forward a lot and i was really surprised to see their analysis of that because they're completely wrong the what i'm doing when i'm when I'm bowing over like that, we'll replace that with bowing. <laughs> what I'm doing when I'm, when I'm doing that, and the reason why my hips are coming backwards is because what I'm trying to do is not change my balance. I don't want to lean forward because if I lean forward, then now that restricts movement again. If I bring, the, if I bring my balance point forward of my feet, then now it completely changes everything. It changes your piece, your, like your conscious piece as you're shooting, meaning like I'm halfway in panic mode because I'm also halfway about to fall over. It changes where my rotation comes from because it, it changes how my balance is. And so therefore what's going to happen is it's not going to allow my lower body to move. And instead my upper body is going to have to move because if my lower body moves now, again, I'm going to fall over. So I'm going to have to end up moving in my shoulders or my hands or my hips, which is not good. So I want to make sure that no matter what height I have to go to, I always maintain that neutral balance and a central point of gravity, a central point of balance that comes right through the center of my body. I'm equaling out balance and counterbalance. It'd be like if you have to stand up against a wall and bend over and touch your toes, you'll fall over. But if you don't have a wall behind you, you have you you naturally create counterbalance to bend over and touch your toes. Mm -hmm. So I, I do that. I bring my posture down in that way until I get to where I want to shoot the bird. So that's the break point. Okay. And I take the, my, I set my posture. I have all these variables because it's very math related. So, um, the highest point in the line of the bird that I'm going to be with it. So if I'm shooting it before the apex, it's going to be the break point. If I'm shooting it after the apex, that point is going to be the apex. So the highest point in the line that I'm going to be connected with the target through, that's what I set my posture for. So I go vertical posture, 45 degrees, bow down to that highest point in the line. Then you'll see me drop my hands, which dismounts my gun. What I'm doing is I'm going from that mounted position to the lowest point in the line that I'm with the bird before I finish mounting the gun. So... That would be my whole point. I'm going down to the height of my whole point in the line of the bird because what I want to do is I want to match my hand speed to the target speed. The only way I can do that is if there's a one-to-one -one ratio between how much the bird moves vertically and how much my gun moves vertically. So if you can imagine three-point line, the target, the barrel, and the stock, I bring my gun down exactly level that much and the way this works is really easy it's totally two-dimensional if i'm looking out there and i use my hand and i point at where that highest point is so let's say i point at my break point and i point at my hold point and i look at how much higher the finger is that's pointing at the break point than the hold point say it's like an inch or two well i have an inch or two draw length that allows my hands to match the speed of the bird then I rotate over to my hold point, which is basically intersecting that point of impact that I have with the gun on the line of the bird. So I'm starting on the line at the hold point. And I'm in now this set posture where all I have to do are two movements. I rotate at the speed of the bird horizontally, which is the X axis. And I bring my hands up at the speed of the bird vertically, which is the Y axis. 
and that gives me the line of the bird. And the moment that my gun touches my face, I pull the trigger. And if you can imagine this in your head, it's like, it's a triangle. Okay, so I go 45 degrees vertical posture, bring my posture down to, um, to the break point. Then I, and then I drop my hand straight down to the height of the, of the hold point. And I rotate over to the hold point. That gives me a 90 degree angle. The line of the bird is the hypotenuse of the triangle. And that's my X speed, which is my rotation over my Y speed, which is my hands. And that lets me be able to shoot. And you've heard me say this word before, proprioceptively. So that means that without being able to aim the gun, I'm not aiming. I'm looking at the bird, but my gun is where the gun needs to be to break the bird at all times. You could have a trigger, a, a trigger. You could have a string on my <laughs> on my trigger and yank it in the middle of my mouth, and I'll still break the bird because the mathematics and the and the uh, body mechanics of how I'm moving don't let my point of impact leave the line of the target. Really? All right. So yep. what you're known for is confusing the hell out of everybody. All yeah. Right. It's hard to do without it, but there's going to be people that understand that, but it's going <laughs> to yeah. listen, Justin, I've found, I have an extremely small demographic, <laughs> a very niche, <laughs> small niche in clay target shooting instruction. So I got to make sure I hit those guys real good. <laughs> yeah. All right. All right. So listen, all right. So you didn't learn this from Wendell. Uh, it uh, is the, the uh, I, I did not learn that explanation from Wendell. It comes from the foundation of what Wendell taught me. What Wendell, the beauty about what Wendell taught me and what Wendell found out, he didn't just teach me this. He came up with this w w is harmony and synchronization. And he's, and I'm back in the day. He never told me that word proprioception, but that's what it is. It is pure trust in connection with the gun and the bird that allows you to, sh if you watch Wendell shoot and another person that does it really well is Richard Falls. It's so beautiful to watch because there is, there is connectedness in the movement of that human being and the movement of that target. It doesn't look desynchronized because it's not. And, and you have to understand everybody's explanation of something comes from how they filter information. I like math and science and I like, I'm a very logical person. Wendell's one of the best musicians I've ever seen play. So his filter is music. And in music, there's harmony and there's interconnectedness and there's all those things. And those are the words that he uses, mm -hmm. but it's the, it's, it's, it's so similar. I, if you listen to our explanations, you're going to be like, that's totally different. If you watch a shoot, you're going to be like, that's exactly the same. I yeah. may have a different way of getting there, but it's, but it's how I communicate it and how I understand it. Yeah. You're talking about shooting at the regional and I've, I remember this and I think it's funny, but there's a towers too. a tower. Wasn't there one tower on each course? Yeah. And it was our last station each day. Yes, it was. That was funny. Yeah. So the, the first day. Did, didn't your phone start ringing while you were shooting? Yeah. And it, I mean, <laughs> so, gosh, so, so he gets up there to shoot and I think the first pair went out he smashes them and his phone was ringing during that pair. I think I, no, it wrong. was a, I think it was a, if it was, it was either a three or four pair station and it was my second last pair that it started to ring in. Okay. And then, <laughs> and I knew I was on a 97 and I'm thinking, cause I've been not able to compete at all for so long. Like I've been in tournaments, but I haven't actually been able to compete. If you know what I mean? Like the difference. Yeah. And I'm thinking like, dang it. I'm on a 97. Nobody's going to touch this score on this course. Like I, <laughs> I feel like I'm like on another planet as how, how much better I was shooting that weekend than I've shot in a year. Right. And, uh, and so I'm like, Phew man, I'm about to blow this round away. People are going to come back. There's high is going to be like 94 on this. They're going to be like, God almighty, David shot 97. That's ridiculous. So that's my mindset going into it. It's not cockiness. It's just, it's confidence. And, uh, and so I've got one on the, the one station everybody's telling me about that is going to be the hardest on the course. And my second last pair, uh, my phones, I have, I have two phones. They're both going off at the same time. And somehow they were, I had my phone on mute and do not disturb. Somehow they were still ringing. 
and my watch is going off and I'm, I'm like, Oh my gosh. So I hit the first pair and then I'm trying to get my phones out and I'm like, what? <laughs> so whatever. I just threw them on the ground and had to finish the last pair out to shoot a 97. And then I come back and see that somebody shot a freaking 98. <laughs> that was Braxton. Yeah. It was an amazing score. Yeah. That was so good. Yeah. So he threw his phone on the ground, you know, it took another 20 minutes till he got ready to shoot that last pair. And you know, ended <laughs> 20 up minutes is my average. So, so explain that to me, not your, yeah. av- not your average. Explain to me how focused you really have to be to shoot targets. You see, yeah. you see what I'm saying? Do you really want this answer? Yeah. But I want you to tell me like, I, like you're talking to me, not some, uh, math professor from Harvard. <laughs> <laughs> the, I mean, it, it, okay. So the thing you got to understand is everybody's different again. And for me, I've got, uh, pretty bad ADHD. So the way that that works for me is that I either am crazy hyper focused or completely distracted. And it really depends on my level of dopamine. So it's like if I'm, if, if I have somehow found a way to connect what I care about to my performance or my process, rather. I will be super focused in the round and you will see me shoot away in a way that looks like what you saw that weekend. Okay. Because I was, I had connected my, my, my definition of success to whether or not I ran a perfect program, not whether or not I shot a good number. So what was happening was the way that an ADHD brain works is you basically don't get dopamine at all. But when you do, it's on something you really enjoy, and then it becomes addictive, and so you can hyper-focus. So it's not generally a good thing. It just happens to be that for what we do, it can be. And so if I can truly, actually, emotionally connect what I believe to be uh, where I'm assigning my value to my process, I will shoot like you saw me there which is really focused. I'm probably not talking that much. I'm working so many probabilities and analytics and running these numbers and doing math in my head. And, and it's by the time I'm done with the round, like I said, I have no gas in the tank. I can barely even drive. And it's like taking a four hour long exam for medical school. And, uh, the other way that I shoot, which will happen if I can't fully connect that dopamine release to my process is that I'm just kind of like a goof, you know, like I'm, I'm having fun. I'm enjoying it. I'm not working real hard before the station. I'm not putting much effort into the reading or the planning and, and all that stuff because I literally can't, my brain won't let me do it. So I recognize that if I try to do that in that moment, it makes me shoot work. So I have to basically kind of not plan anything or the other way is if I am in the moment where I can hyper-focus, then I do have to do that because I can shoot incredibly good. I can shoot close to the same numbers either way, but I'll make more mistakes when I'm goofing off. But then again, I don't really care because I'm goofing off and I've not assigned my value to my performance. And so I have fun regardless. Um, so, but when I'm in a round like what you saw there, the only thing that I can explain to you without literally making this podcast four hours long and explaining to you how I think uh, and what I'm thinking about, I mean, I'm going through, I'm reading the line to do the math on finding the height of the bird, looking at the vertical differential between my start and my finish, feeling like letting my body feel the vertical speed of the bird, which is different than the horizontal speed of the bird. I'm trying to process those two things, get my body to do them both at the same time. I'm trying to learn how my eyes are, are titrating on those birds at that time with that light at that speed and those angles and those distances. And I'm trying to say, okay, like if I want to shoot the bird at, at three quarters of the way through the, through the flight path and it takes me one quarter of the flight path to see the bird good, then I need to make sure I start, my gu- I start working my eyes um, two quarters of the way th- or one half of the way through the flight path so that they get to 100% at the break point. I'm, I'm analyzing which bird to shoot first, and I'm going through something like, you know, okay, here's this pair, and I can approach it. Like a, a perfect example would be, um, uh, would be any of the pairs you saw me shoot ridiculously fast, right? So let's take, for example, that very last pair on Sunday that we finished on. 
or no, the, a better one would be that big orange flopping crosser at 45 yards and then that 90 millimeter Shondell coming from the left at like 70 yards, 65 yards. You remember that one? It was mm-hmm. like our second last station. Yeah. I shot that, that second Shondell, the millisecond I saw it out of the trees, I pulled the trigger, right? Yeah. For me, that's, I mean, I can, that's not, I recognize that's not a high probability shot for me. But what I'm trying to weigh the option of is where is the biggest net benefit? If I approach it that way, mechanically, it's much harder. But I take all the chance and luck out of it that I get with the wind. Because if I shoot it the way that's mechanically harder, then, I mean, if I shoot it the way that's mechanically easier, which is like at the apex or after the apex, I can make a nice, long, slow move on it and, and you know, kind of relax and see it really good. Well, All four shots I take on that are completely different. And if I see barrel on that shot and I try to replicate a picture, I'm going to miss because the wind is changing the bird. It's changing the line of the bird. It's changing the distance and the speed of the bird. Do I want to leave? If I know I got to basically run this course out, do I want to lose it because I did everything right and the wind cost me? Or do I want to lose it because I decided to go big or go home and I'm betting on my ability to be mechanically perfect and eliminate chance? So I have to get to every station and run that. Which one gives me the better opportunity? Run a self-analysis on, okay, if I'm going to bet on mechanics over chance, do I feel right now that I can trust my mechanics? Do I have the energy? Are my eyes good enough? Are they quick enough? Do I have the trust? Do I have the confidence? Do, Do I have the mechanical ability to make that move? Does this pair set me up where I'm in position to do that in time? Um, and I'm, uh, and then I make the decision on this pair. Yes, I'm going to do it on the next pair. No, maybe I'm not. I'm running that kind of stuff nonstop in my head throughout three hours. And, uh, and it's, it, it, it takes so much focus. And that's why, you know, if I'm in that mode, it's hard to talk to me because I don't even realize that you're talking to me. Um, not because I'm being rude, but because my I'm just so focused on doing all that stuff. You know, and that's a super abbreviated version of what's going on. I mean, the the, the reality of it is, which is crazy. I hate to hear the long version. Yeah, it's not that interesting. (laughs) (laughs) The the reality of it is, you know, I mean, that sounds ridiculous. Uh, You know, for 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 ninety nine percent of the people listening to this podcast, they're going to think that's stupid, or it's it's not needed, or it's like that's overkill. The reality of it is all that extra work gives me 0.5 of of a percent of a better performance. That gives me one target. But if I shot one target more, I would have come home with $5,000 more. And so the, the guys that I have to beat to win have gotten so freaking good over the past three to five years that you have to do that. You know, I mean, you, if I don't do that, I'm, it's not even worth me showing up. And so, and you know, my version of that might be completely different than how Anthony approaches or how Joe Finese does, but, but we all go into our, you know, hundred percent effort for 0.5% return version of ourselves when we're shooting and and we have to do it because otherwise, you know, you're just not competitive. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone listening, imagine David shooting after he's done his pre-shot routine. Okay. This <laughs> yeah. whole process. And I'm telling you, do you remember the station where there was a fast quarter in target from the left? It was kind of down in, in the, it was a green target coming fast yeah. from the left. Yeah. Yeah. The report there, yeah. right, like quartering out from the right quarter out from the left. Oh my, it took us 45 minutes for, for him to get those, those four pair out of the way. <laughs> Unbelievable. Yeah. I'm telling well, you. Well, half of that time I was so freaking nervous that I that I, <laughs> half of half of my program was bringing myself back down to a level at which I knew I could make those moves cuz as nervous as I was, I knew my eyes wouldn't work good and my and my physical movement wasn't re- wasn't there. Yeah. Yeah, I mean it, it's hard. And here's the thing about that. Doing that type of program costs you because there was a station the first day, if you remember, um it was the first two I missed where, uh, I dropped two on one station, right? Yeah. It was a true pair left to right cr- crossers. Well, it was because of how slow I was going that we didn't have a squad three stations in front of us. 
And so I didn't get to see, I was up first there and I didn't get to see the pair. I got two chances and I looked at it each way once and I didn't get enough information. Had I not been going that slow, I would have been able to watch a whole squad shoot that pair. And then I would have had the information and I would have shot 99 that day because it was not a hard pair. I just didn't, I got two chances to see it and I made a bad judgment call with, with, with 25% of the information that I needed and, and it cost me two easy birds. But that's, you know, so that kind of thing happened. And the same thing happened for, for maybe one bird on the second day. Um, but that's, but then you got to run the, the, the analysis of, well, if I wasn't doing that, would I have lost more than three birds? You know, you never know. But it's just the game you play. I thought you just talked yourself into speeding up. Uh, listen, it, it ain't never going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> hey, did you see that video that I put up? I know you did because I tagged you in it. Uh, with Wendell, you and Tom all put together and your pre-shot routine. I did. What a cool video. Yeah. So, so I, I'm sure it varies, but I think it was like a second on that video difference. And Tom yeah. was actually the longest, I think, which is kind of weird. I, and I was the fastest. I want credit for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. So in, in that video, like I said, it was about, it was pretty amazing because there was about a second. All right. Yeah. But could you imagine the people behind you? If you all were shooting together, I mean, the squad, oh, the squads we, that you would hold up and they have to, I mean, it's like me and Steve, which is Tom's dad. We just lost all <laughs> desire to shoot. It was like, okay, we're four <laughs> stations in. I have, I don't, I don't care. I mean, just look, go look at our score. You'll see what I'm talking about. It's, <laughs> it's like, I mean, wh- what in the hell are y'all sitting there thinking about? I mean, my, well, we got to put you people like you and Steve on the, on our squad so we can make it through the course. <laughs> <laughs> it'd be dark <laughs> we gotta balance it out the yin and the yang the slow and the fast <laughs> yeah i'm telling you man it is something oh, to watch now it's yeah it's um it's <laughs> do you remember well, the right, thing so, is, so the squad behind us they mm, were they I were felt all so bad for them yeah yeah i mean they well, were, kevin was in that i guarantee you that we screwed him up well, I mean, yeah, they were always there. We weren't even halfway through the squad shooting, and they were already finished the station behind Our us. Our first guy <laughs> would be two pairs in, and they're already there. You put They put the slowest squad in the NSA right in front of the fastest squad in the NSA. <laughs> I mean, that was terrible planning. It was. I, I felt so bad. Well, they got to see plenty of show birds, I can tell you that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, my goodness, because sure. they were there for all of Holy. us. Yes. So, so, all right. So everyone talks about a lot of things you can do before, during the tournament, but, Uh and how you can get focused on the task at hand, but no one ever talks about really like days and weeks into the night before how you prepare, how you prepare yourself for that day. Uh, it's important to do what you do. And the reality of it is you as a shooter yourself, you have to do the work, the prep work to know what works best for you. I can give you some things that are important. Number one is your nutrition and your hydration. Um, the uh, you And I would say, honestly, if you're super serious about this, go to a doctor and, and get a blood test done and figure out what kind of things you need to be eating. Um, tell them what you're trying to do wh- and they can tell you what type of uh, things are important for that. Uh, what what time of, type of nutrients, what type of vitamins, what type of supplements are important. You know, we're talking about not just th- things to feed your body, but to feed your brain, make you think better, re- uh, decrease cortisol levels for stress and anxiety, uh, allow you to think faster, see better. And so that needs to be implemented in your diet early, um, if not all the time. Uh Sleep is a massive one, and uh, if there's, I've got so many students um, that have sleep problems. I mean, uh, you know, I mean, I used to have sleep apnea. I can't tell you how much of a difference it made when I got rid of that problem. I mean, literally a massive difference. Energy levels are better, eyes are better. So you got to make sure that you're sleeping good and start running like learning how you sleep better, learn what time, you know, you can, you can mess around with your, uh, your circadian rhythm. And, uh, I think that's what it's called where like when your body knows when it's time to go to sleep and wake up, 
Um, literally the way that you wake up is important for the day of a shoot. If you wake up in the hotel and you keep the blinds drawn and it's dark in there and you turn the TV on and or sit on your phone, you're not waking your brain and your eyes up. When you wake up, you need to open the curtains, get some sunlight in. It, it, it releases a hormone in your brain that tells your body to wake up, changes the way you see, think, can move, all that kind of stuff. Um, and that makes a massive difference. Get a routine, be consistent in what you do, care about what you eat, um, care about how you practice. Uh, and then, and then lastly, honestly, probably the one thing everyone will sit here and talk to you about practicing and talk to you about nutrition and talk to you about hydration. But the one thing that people I have not yet heard a person talk about on a podcast, except for one guy, which is the guy that taught me everything I know is Wendell. And you got to get your life in a peaceful place. If you've got drama or if you've got stress or if you've got whatever it is on your mind, you just can't, you just can't do it. You, you can't go and win a, a tournament. You have to find peace in, in, in whatever it is. And, you know, if you've got, pro if you've got a lot of stress at work, you need to either learn to get, to not think of that and be present, or you got to go take care of that problem. If you've got problems in, uh, it, with, with whatever I was about to say money, but I was going to say, if you got money problems, you shouldn't be going to the shooting tournament. <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> the, uh, whatever the problem is, you know, you gotta, you gotta work it out. And, um, because you just, you'll just be distracted the whole round. And that's probably one of the biggest things. <laughs> See, you got to understand my filter is if I got money problems, I got to go shoot. <laughs> oh, that was funny. <laughs> you shouldn't be going to the shooting tournament. <laughs> yeah, you probably should stay at work. <laughs> so, oh, man. So I've been bringing up a lot of things on the last few podcasts, and one of them has been as far as growing the sport. Um, Everybody talks about that and, and has their own opinions about it. I seem to think, and I talked to Theo Ribs about this, that it's social media is the only way that we can really grow it and get the word out to people. There's no other way to do that in the, in sporting clays. Do you, mm -hmm. do you agree with that? Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, stuff like that. Is that how you would grow it or would you do it some other way? I think, I think, yeah, you definitely have to, you have to use that as a medium to grow it. But that is only a source of communication mm -hmm. and it's, it's a source of disseminating information. So I think what you got to do is you got to create heroes and then you got to make people be inspired to try the game or get companies to see the value in, in using the game uh, for, for team building and networking. And, you know, our organization, the NSCA is, let's say, you know, their numbers might be anywhere from 20 to 30,000 people. I don't know what it is. There's really two, two to 5,000 people that shoot this game in the NSCA. There's 16 million people that play the game and, or have shot the game where you're going to grow the sport is, you know, why is it that I own a range and I have corporate events at my range and when I get a major corporation to send 75 people to my range, they come in and they're like, so uh, what do you do? <laughs> I, <laughs> I cut the grass. You know, yeah, I'm just, a, I'm just a laborer. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm just the emasculated boyfriend of the Olympian. <laughs> the... Uh, <laughs> the uh but the, that's the problem if you if 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 any guy on the pga tour owned a club and they did a corporate event at the club and any company sent a guy sent sent a hundred people there every person there would know that guy yeah and it's because of we we don't have heroes in our sport we do inside that tight little community but that'd be the equivalent of saying that like the guys who got their tour card look to people who have won major championships. They're all still professionals. Every person in the NSCA is essentially a professional compared to the other 16 million. And so what we have to do is, and you know, we were, 
I got, I'm, I got to, I just thought of this and I'm, I gotta uh, say it, you know, the, um, the, th- you, you had Scott Robertson on the podcast and he talked about the PSCA mm-hmm. and he talked about putting the, putting the PS, like why do it on TV when we can do it on the internet? Yeah. I, I'm going to be on hundred percent honest with you, Justin, Brad Kidd and I were the ones that brought that idea to the owners of the PSCA and Scott Robertson was the one that shut it down. Huh. The, that type of thing is what we need to get rid of. We need to get rid of, uh, things like, you know, it's, if everybody in the game understood that if they were selfless, that we would all be better off. No one person can make a lot of money and try to hoard shoots or hoard ideas or take credit for things. Um, you know, like we got to we got to work as a community to to do things like having a PSCA on the internet so it can be viral and every person that has a mobile device can watch it and then kids can watch these people play this game where they shoot a, shoot a gun and blow things up say man that guy's cool who is that and build a platform so they can find out about us and put it on social media and then have them come to my place and then they know who I am right you know that's the kind of thing that you need and yeah absolutely the social media thing is what uh is what what drives all that but it's got to be more than you know because i i can only hit the end of my audience which is five thousand people on facebook i can't branch out to people who have never heard of me before i can by doing viral things and stuff like that but still not good we need we need programs we need initiatives we need we need like the nsca to get behind doing stuff we need we need to be able to prove that, you know, to, we need to, we need the NSCA to be able to go to a major corporate company and be like, Hey, look, we've got a demographic of 16 million people that, and, and 85% of them are, are the exact demographic of people that are your customer. How much is that worth to you? Because what can we do to help you? Or better yet, here's what we can do to help you, you know, get money in the sport and get people, you know, that's what we need. And, and, uh, uh, th- that would be so cool to have happen, but unfortunately, I don't, I don't know, you know, like everybody has a different too many, opinion. I mean, there's all kind of different ways. Yeah, you know, there's too many barriers to doing stuff like that, and you know, I'm not smart enough to know how to get around it. Yeah, all right, so- I have to wear shoes that are for people that can't walk. <laughs> If you're not careful, you'll break your toe wearing them shoes. I'm gonna tell you right now. There's one thing you can't yeah. do: set your gun down on top of your shoe. You'll cr- you'll smash your foot. It's hard. Yeah, you got to roll your toe up and put it at the end of the shoe. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so listen, I'm going to put you on the spot here. All right, so yeah. talking about heroes, not counting yourself, who who do you think would be the first hero in sporting clays? Who do you think it would Man, be? Man, that's a good question. You'd got to go with with someone who has a who has a story, you know, I the Man, I don't even know. I, that is such a good question. That might be the best question I ever got asked on a podcast. I don't know. Um, I know who I would say. Who would it be? It, well, it would have to be somebody young. Okay. Yeah. In my opinion, it would have to be somebody young because you can't have a forty-five-year-old hero. I mean, no. You're supposed to be retired by then. You know what I'm saying? So yeah, yeah. So I would say Finesi. Yeah. Yeah, you'd got to go. Well, and the reality of it is that the who the hero is is gonna is gonna be a dynamically changing thing. As you know, as as Finizi gets to be my age, then there's gonna be another Finizi, you know, and yep. that kind of thing. And you, you, that's why I said you got to have somebody with a story because you got to root for the guy that isn't supposed to win. You know, we've got to we've got how old is he? Eighteen. Yep. Yeah, we got an eighteen-year-old kid in his just starting his first year of college, and and he's going up and beating guys that have been doing it for. I mean, I've been shooting this game for two years longer than he's been alive. Yeah, and th- and there's guys that have been doing it for twice his age, like Kime Bomb. Yeah, you know, and uh, you know, so you got to root for you got to root for that guy, you yeah. know, and and then and then when he gets my age, you got to root for the next guy. Well, that was my answer. What is your answer? 
I think it's got to be something like that. You know, it's got to be someone who who's not supposed to win. Um, and I, and I hope when he listens, you know, when he listens to that, he doesn't take that the wrong way. I mean, that's a massive compliment. You know, he, he's got, he doesn't have the years of experience. He doesn't have the experience of putting him in himself in the situations to close. And he does. So, and I, and I have those and I didn't. So, um, you know, you got to root for, you got to root f- for someone like Venezi or Todd Hitch. Um, yeah. the, Tom sees past his prime. Uh, I think the, he retired, <laughs> when he wrecked that motorcycle, he just hung it up. I think he's done. Yeah, hung it. Just quit. Might as well just take over that whole company. He, <laughs> I think he's. I more, told Tom. I said Tom. I said Tom. When I said because he called me one time and somehow we were talking about life and I said Tom, you need to just retire from the shooting and go work for your dad and then when he retires, you can take over the business and then you can pay for all my shooting. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't Tom, listen, isn't Tom the quirkiest? Have you ever seen somebody that when they get hungry, they have to eat within 30 seconds of that feeling? Otherwise, the world will end. <laughs> Is Tom that way? You didn't notice that? No. Uh-uh. It doesn't matter what you're doing. We got to go. I'm hungry. We got to go. <laughs> David, we got to go. It's like, Tom, I'm not done with the round yet. Well, hurry it up because I'm hungry. <laughs> You've never noticed that. Uh-uh. No. I noticed oh, that we were riding around and you know, at the last shoot and the only thing he could focus on was where he was going to stop and eat. So, I mean, that could be yeah. what you're talking about. But, oh yeah, he had to find a place saying. to eat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Tom's way past his prime. Tom. When he when he hit that tree, it was over with. It's over. I mean, I've never seen a, I didn't know that a person can do that much damage to a tree. <laughs> <laughs> Did you? No, but you know those, you know, I mean, and he probably don't want us telling, telling this, but you know, when he had to have those dentures put in those replacement <laughs> teeth, <laughs> oh my God. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I know what you're talking about. I mean, it was kind of funny because there's a, we went into a store and there's a black light in there for some reason. And when he walked by, started talking. <laughs> You can only see those feet. You can only see the teeth that were fake. <laughs> oh man! I, and, and I know he told me not to tell anybody that. So I, I mean, but, but it is what it is. I mean, oh man! When he hit that tree, all this—it it was like, you know, it just like they just fell out. That you know, they kind of bent them in a little bit, and, and he had a full face helmet on. And they just kind of fell out, and they looked like chiclets laying on the ground everywhere. So he just had to. You know, I mean, Tom ain't walk around with no teeth. I mean, come on. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> you ever seen? <laughs> uh, you ever seen that movie, uh, it, that cough movie, and the one guy gets punched in the face and his teeth fall out, and uh, <laughs> he, he gets up and he goes, my tooth and my nose. And the one guy goes, quite frankly, it's an improvement. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so oh. uh, next time if you if you watch tom and he smiles you'll see what i'm talking about he's, he's <laughs> you know how people smile sometimes it kind of like cover their teeth when they smile because they want people looking at yeah them? he does that yeah. now he didn't used to do that <laughs> does he yeah yeah but i mean it's new it's something yeah. new he has to get used to it and i mean i think if you noticed if he, he wasn't sticking his butt out as much as mine because when he leans forward, there's not enough weight in the front anymore now that he has to counterbalance back. Yeah. Because of those teeth. They're yeah. more hollow. Yeah. Well, I, yeah. Yeah. Without a doubt. I mean, it's, you know, well, for he, sure. He, he was, and they're, and they're not fully like in there yet. Like they have to, like, <laughs> they haven't, like, got, set up. He's got to screw them in every once in a while. Yeah. He has to tighten them up. One was hanging off yeah, about a quarter good. inch longer than the other one. I said, Tom, what's wrong with your teeth? He said, Dad, Gummin, I forgot to tighten them up this morning. So you got a Phillips? <laughs> I think it's Allen Allen wrench, but I mean, oh, is it? Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. So he's uh anyway. If you see Tom, just you know, ask him how his teeth are. Hello. Yeah, just tell him to smile for you. <laughs> Holy crap! <laughs> so anyway, all right. Well, Dave, thanks thanks for coming on, man. I appreciate you spending some time with me. I was just gonna say, I like how you. You know, you've, you've had, uh, you know, you brought this podcast in, you, you brought back 
the behind the break episodes and then you gave Gary his own podcast. Uh, I think that's cool. I like it. I mean, <laughs> I can see why I'm also a little nervous about you. I'm not going to get any business deals in case with you in case you get sued and I lose any of my assets. <laughs> but the, uh, but, uh, the, but no, I think that's cool. I think that's a cool idea. Uh, I mean, you go back to that question that you asked me about how do you go to sport and you just got uh, the, the best answer to that is just create content you know yeah, yeah yeah that's what you got to do man i mean you gotta yeah if you really want it to get out there you can you can make your own way if that, you know and i i said this again in another podcast that the nsca don't post anything on facebook that i've ever seen no nah. so if they're not going to do it somebody else needs to do it and, yeah and that's got, just kind of the way i look at it isn't that crazy to you i mean yeah what what governing organization doesn't i always wonder we drive into nationals. You're driving in there and you see the advertisements for nationals to sign up for the next year. It's like, you already got us. You, <laughs> what about the people that aren't here? <laughs> no, what? that's $40,000 in flags you spent so that we show up the next year, but we're already here. You know, I mean, the, we, man, it would be just awesome if we got a, like a awesome marketing team in there and, and could you know it's super easy the model's already there you're not inventing a new world here you just literally look at any successful organization and copy everything they do well I mean, here's a good example so the the nsca's facebook page has 78 7800 like yeah people like their page you yeah know, you know the clay shooting group that's on facebook yeah they, they don't have it yeah. 24,000 yeah i mean really? i'm an I'm a admin of both of them and um i never get i very rarely get notifications of m member requests or post things on the nsca one yeah you know it's because you gotta you gotta give a reason for people to be engaged that clay shooting one you know there there's there's always dialogue there so people are going to be involved yeah yeah well maybe one day they'll figure it out We'll see if we can. Yeah, help, I hope. See if we can help him with. It. You know, Tom would make a great poster boy for the for the NSCA. <laughs> it just says, "If this guy can do this game, so can you." Yeah, and he could smile with his yeah. hat on and his mullet. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> with an, with with remains of an Allen wrench sticking out of his teeth. Yeah, do you think that's the reason why Wendell got a mullet because of Tom, or did Tom get a mullet because of Wendell? Oh, that's a good question. I think that Wendell. <laughs> I think Wendell's doing it for a little bit. You know, I think he's lost a lot of weight. He's gotten really healthy. He looks, I think good. He's he moving. looks good too. Yeah, he does look good. And I think he's moving faster. And I think he needed a little bit more aerodynamic, aerodynamic drag in his rotation. So he let it grow a little. And with Tom having to not be able to, you know, with his arm being in a cast for so long, it's kind of the same situation. He's got lighter teeth. Yeah. He's got a, he's got a, a cadaver ear. And, uh, you know, so he's got to do the same thing. He knocked his ear off too. Oh yeah. Gone. No wonder he can't hear the traps on the left side. Maybe that's, th that's true. Now does you he notice he missed all those left to right. Now does he still put an earplug in that ear or does he just, what does he I do? I wouldn't imagine the, the point of it. Well, he just didn't want to look funny. I mean, that's true. Yeah. You don't, you don't want to draw attention. Yeah. So, all right. Anyway, I'll let you go. I appreciate you coming on, man. Good luck hunting. And, uh, <laughs> thanks, man. I, I'll, I guess I'll see you at nationals if you go there. So yeah, I'll hopefully I'll be there unless I'm on that two month hunting trip. There you go. All right, man. <laughs> see you, Dave. All right. We'll talk to you later. All right.